Welcome to the White Knuckle Podcast with your hosts, Jason Science and Dr. Clint McCoy. Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 120 of the White Knuckle Podcast powered by UC Hunting Properties. Tonight, I've got my esteemed co-host, Mr. Clint McCoy, on the other line. Clint, how's it going tonight? All right, Jason, man. Glad to be here with you guys. And uh, on the other line, just uh, just fresh in from uh, a sit outside or whatever it was you were doing in your shirt sleeves and negative one degrees, Mr. Dan Infall. Dan, how's it going? Real good, real good. Good. Well, hey, I wanted to to get with you as we often do this early in the year to talk about um, winter scouting and and uh, before we get to that though, tell us how your year went. If you, for those of you who are listening that may live under a rock, um, tell us how your year went and uh, and how it turned out. Nah, it was it was a pretty awesome year. I got to hunt the whole season. Uh, the downfall was I got to the last day and I didn't end up with a buck, but uh, that's okay. Um, it's only the second season I've ever not shot in a buck. So, um, but I got to chase them and, uh, I can't argue because, uh, I, uh, missed three and passed three. So oh, pretty nice. Gosh. Oh man. So, what, uh, well, what happened? Uh, uh, other than, I don't know. Other than um, your arrow didn't hit its mark. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, every shot I took was, um, uh, the, the three shots I took, I was real confident on. I don't know how I ended up without getting a, uh, a buck. I really don't. <laughs> One of them, I, uh, I shot at him walking. Um, but I normally shoot deer walking under it. It went real close, you know, with a 10 yard shot. And, uh, I hit high and, uh, went through the back straps and, uh, uh, one of them, I, I kind of panicked on where I drew the bow in my, uh, uh, well, uh, oh, well, so I'm sitting there and I was going to get down and, uh, and knock my arrow and stuff. And all of a sudden I heard a squirrel barking. Okay. So I'm like, at this time of evening, right around closing time, you think of a squirrel's barking, there's a deer coming, you know? So I, uh, I look up and sure enough, there's a deer coming. So I start concentrating on this deer. It comes in, and at first I thought it was uh, a buck that I had passed the week before that has one big antler. Oh, sure. Okay. So I wasn't I wasn't getting real interested, but it was you know I wanted to let him pass and watch him. And when he got close, he looked in my direction, and I realized it wasn't that buck. It was a buck that had like a broken and healed antler on the other side that was laying alongside of its face, grown back on. Okay. And it was really really cool. And I decided I was going to shoot him. And at that point, he's already at 20 yards. So I whipped over and grabbed my bow back off the limb I had put it on. And when he gets to 10 yards, I draw the bow and realize I never put an arrow back on it. I mean, oh, can you believe that? <laughs> what a rookie mistake. <laughs> so I let the, the buck's looking at me, and I'm at full draw without an arrow on my, on my wrist. Um, and I'm like, well, what do you do? You know, so I just let the bow down. Uh-huh. And he just stood there. So I just thought, well, I'll try. And I reached over and got another arrow. And I put the arrow on. And he just starts walking. And I drew the bow again. And it was rut, so maybe he was a little off. And uh, when I get the bow back, my string had twisted or something, and the peak was sideways. And uh, I thought at 10 yards, I can't miss. And I shot and missed. You know, I, I thought I could look through the, the solid part of the peak and kind of figure where the pin was and I, I just missed and um, the other one uh, uh, I'm, I'm sitting in a spot and I have this uh, doe go past right after I got in the tree and this big buck's following it and that buck had man it had like 16 points it had stuff sticking on all over the place and uh, it holds up at uh, 20 yards and the doe gets downwind to me and stomps and I'm thinking, this buck's in rut. He's going to follow her. You know, he don't smell me. The wind's perfect for me, but she's downwind. Mm-hmm. And she trots off. She doesn't really run, but she trots. 
But that was enough to freak him out where he just sat there staring forever. It took like 10 minutes. And all he had to do was take like two steps. Mm. And I'm thinking, I could have actually shot him where he was at. I would have just had to kind of like move a little funny because there's a branch in the way. Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking, I'm just going to wait. He's going to follow that doe. There's no way he's going to turn around and leave. Well, after about 10 minutes, I'll say he turns around and, and takes like two jumps. And when he did that, I mean, first of all, I didn't expect it, but I, I drew the bow out of instinct as soon as he ran, hoping he'd stop. And when he hesitated in an opening, I shot, and he ducked my arrow. <laughs> ducked uh-huh. right underneath it. So, I mean, it was a crazy season. It was uh, it was a little rough, but, uh, you know, I've got enough bucks down. It was just fun chasing them all season, and, and that really don't bother me that much. Yeah, yeah Dan, let me ask you. Let me ask you, Dan. Um, I, I follow you a lot there on on you know, social, and I was following you towards a, a lot more towards the tail end of the season as you were you know, describing your you know how difficult it's been and, and the hardships that you've had. There's a lot. I think there's a lot of younger hunters that when they have a when they botch something or something doesn't go their way, it just wrecks them and, and mm-hmm. it gets into their head. Do you like? How do you how do you cope with like like you said you just said it? I've, I've shot a lot of I've shot a lot of bucks, but how do you go back out to the timber the next day? Do you do anything special? And, and second part of that question is: Is there anything that you want to do in the off season, or work on in the off season, or change, or anything that you would do differently than you did this year? Uh, so. So for me, it's a, it's a little bit different. I, I think most people uh, um, miss a shot, and, it, and like you said, it wrecked them. I mean, they, they've been working so hard for the shot and, you know, building up to it, and they get it, and they blow it, and they, they wreck it. And for me, I always think the next day is another day, and I'll get another chance. But I think one thing it did for me is, is um, towards the end of the season, when I saw the end coming, I thought, oh, no, you don't. I'm going to put her in overdrive, and I'm going to, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to, I'm going to get a buck, you know? And I really dug down deep and tried hard and, uh, it did a lot for me. It actually, uh, improved my hunting and brought me back, uh, 20 years. I started seeing some things in me that I thought I didn't even know was missing. Um, like I started running out and scouting three or four places and then picking the best one and hunting it. And that's, and it didn't dawn on me, but I started to realize that now I never hunt the same spots twice. And I, you know, I'm scouting all the time and stuff, but I started to think, you know, this is what I used to do all the time. 20, 30 years ago when I used to just shoot giants every year, you know, and I got to get back into that rhythm. So actually the bad season has probably helped me mentally and physically be better where I think most people kind of get, like you said, wrecked by it where it, it uh, flusters them and they, they start losing their confidence and stuff. I've got plenty of confidence, so it doesn't, it doesn't bother me there. But I think it actually helped me. Um, Dan, do you think of some of that ego, too? Like, if you've got a lot of bucks to your credit and a lot of guys get that, like, you know, I'm invincible attitude, and then, then they have a season that really struggles with, I mean, I, I think, and, and I think it's difficult to maybe sit your own pride aside and go, you know what? I need to work and do different things. My formula this season that I have been using didn't work. I think it's sometimes hard to sit all that down. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, if you take a look at the, your, your average guy, you know, and you, you watch their personalities like online, and you see these guys that, um, uh, you know, they knock one or two or three bucks down off and they think they're invincible and they're the greatest hunter in the world because in their community, they probably are, right? And, and they'll start making comments like, I never miss a buck. And, you, you know, look at this guy. You think he's a pro. He misses all these deer. And, you, you know, and uh, and you just sit there and go, oh, yeah, just wait, buddy. Because <laughs> everybody yeah. that's been around a while misses deer exactly. or has a bad season. Exactly. You know, and then you'll see those guys miss a deer or something, and it just destroys them. And they'll be like, I don't know, it never happens to me. It must be the bull. It must be, you know, and they can't get past it where, you know, it's just another day. And for, for me, what would have killed my season, what would have um, what would have sucked is if, if I didn't have opportunities. 
you know, that's all, that's all I want is another day in the woods, another day chasing deer. And I want to be in the game and have those deer around. Kill them really doesn't matter that much. I mean, it gets, it, when you get a bunch of them under your belt, and I know you guys can relate to this, but I don't know if all your viewers can, it gets to the point where once you kill it, I mean, you're, it's cool for a day or two, but then it's on the wall and you're thinking about the next one. And that might sound like, um, uh, like a killer with no conscience, but, that's the drive that gets it done. That drive that, you, you know, you, you're worrying about that next year all the time and you don't stop just because you killed one. I mean, it's always that motivation and that motivation that always thinking about a deer is always thinking about tomorrow. So I don't dwell on today, you know, whether it's a, a miss or a kill, I'm worried about tomorrow. Interesting. So, Dan, you, you mentioned something that, that often plagues me, and that's, you know, um, having confidence. Uh, and it, maybe maybe it boils down to confidence in your scouting, confidence in your spot, confidence just period, period that you're sitting where you, where you should. I had, I had a great season, early season, and then, you know, late season it, it fell apart, and I found myself becoming more complacent as time went along because I just didn't feel like I was in the hunt. I didn't, wasn't seeing any deer. Do you ever find yourself in that situation? And, and, and if so, what do you do to sort of reset yourself? Well, um, in this season, I mean, we're getting to be long. I get there just a little bit, not as bad as you described, but it gets to the point where you don't know where to turn. And the biggest thing is scouting. If you ain't on a deer, go find one, get on them. I mean, I came into late season here and I had some friends, uh, 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 a podcaster said he's going to be in the area. He wanted to hunt, and I threw him some ideas in some of my spots. And a friend came down and hunted a bunch of my spots. And then I had some time, and I'm like, okay, well, now where am I going to go? You know, right? And you're looking around, and like, uh, I got this spot where I'm on that big buck, and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to kill this buck. And I get in there, and there's this guy running hounds for coyotes in there, and he's in a contest, and he's just running these dogs through the whole woods and he just messed up all the bedding areas and everything else. I mean, right the bedding area I was going to hunt where I believe this buck was living, the guy came out of two days in a row. You know, he, that's where he was starting his coyote run. And uh, I just gave up, you know, on that property. I, I knew that I would sit there and I would struggle there. So now I'm sitting there with, okay, I was dependent on that and I put these other guys in those spots. Now what buck am I going to go after or whatever? And for me, I... I want to go after a certain buck. You know, I don't want to just go randomly hunt the woods. Right. So, um, I just put it on a mission and I went out and found one. I went driving around. I went and looked at uh, all the public lands. I drove around and looked at the tracks crossing the roads. Um, luckily we had some snow on the ground, but it kept snowing, which was kind of throwing me off because it kept covering track. You couldn't see nothing, but I kept just pushing until I got onto deer. And then I would check several spots and, going to the best one. And I covered a lot of ground. A few counties drove around. But I think most people in that situation just keep going to the same farm or they keep going to the same property. And if the deer aren't there, you're wasting your time. Or you're just going to make you struggle harder and harder and harder trying to make something happen or hoping something happens. Right. You got to go out and make it happen. I mean, you, you know, look at um, how much scouting I do and how many big bucks I know about, know where they hang and stuff. And I can go through a whole season without killing a big buck. So, I mean, if, if you're not up to par with my scouting, I mean, you could really think you're just going to go out there and just get one that easy. You've got to be in good spots just about every hunt. You know what I mean? So you got to go out there and really just seek them and find them, you know, and hunt them down. When you And you made mention of something there that, like strikes a chord in me and it's something that I've been trying to teach my boy lately. And it's something that I've, I kind of started doing, having this kind of mindset after I had the worst season I ever had in 2012 where I didn't kill a buck. And it's like that season, I just kind of reset the, I just kind of reset everything in me. And each time I go, I, I try to consciously each time I go, out whether it's summer scouting or hanging trail cameras or even postseason scouting like this before i even set foot out of the truck i have to think about 
what is the objective that I want to accomplish at this moment with this action? I think you hit on it. Like instead of haphazardly hunting spots, you got to have objectives and you have to work towards the common goal of killing a big buck. And if he ain't there, you're wasting your time. Like you said, that that's a hard mindset to get into, especially when you're, you know, you try and pigeonhole yourself and just keep forcing the square peg in the round hole, so to speak. If something's not working, change it and, and change the objective. I, I think that's really helped me over the years. Joe, I, I'd agree. I mean, if, if I look at my season, I would say that's kind of my downfall. When I got to the end there, I looked at the end and I'm thinking, man, if I could have hunted the whole season, like I hunted the last week or, or every day, like it's the last day, man, would I have had a good season? You know, but you got to go in there with that gusto and play hard, play to win. I mean, it's like the football team that goes out there, and it's early in the season, so they're just out there playing. Well, you got to play every game to win if you're, you know, going to be a pro football team. And, and you got to do the same thing if you really want to knock down giant bucks. I mean, you can't take a day for granted. Um, I sat uh, about 100 times this year. And I think your average guy probably sits, you know, 20, 30. You know, um, if, if, if you sit um, 20 times in a season, Man, that's not a lot. I mean, you got to you got to up your odds, and you got to be in the right spot when you do sit. You know, Dan, do you think? And, and I'll ask you, Clint, as well. Um, you guys can both give your two cents because you're looking at it from sort of different perspectives. But I think, although they're different, they're the same. And that's: Do you think if you didn't have so many places to choose from, like many of us um, are private land hunters, and there's a lot of public you know, public land hunters. Um, Clint, I, I think you primarily do private, but you've got a bunch of different spots. Geographically, they're all very separate from one another. I've got one huge spot um, that is, you know, you know, tons and tons of room for me to hunt and make different decisions on. But, you know, you mentioned, you know, just going scouting and whether it's, you know, the 10th of November, um, does, do you think that changes Dan for you if you were just hunting a property? Well, yeah, but I, I, I try really hard not to put myself in that kind of box. Even if I go on a road trip or something, if I get into a property and I don't like it, I'm finding something else. I, I'm, I'm going to go look at the public. I'm going to go, you know, uh, if I have to knock on doors or whatever I, I got to do, but I'm, I'm not going to lock myself in a box and being stuck in a spot that um, doesn't appear to be good to me. You know, I'd rather just pack up and go home. Um, you know, I know some states don't have a lot of public and you get in there and there's one or two properties and then, and then you kind of do get in that hard spot. But, um, you know, I would travel or whatever I had to do. I mean, you, you got to be where the deer are in order to kill them. And, and sometimes you're just not going to be there in the same properties. You know, you take it, like, look around my house. Um, I might look at 10 public properties, and I'll only hunt one of them. And only one of them will have what I want. You know, I, I've got to go seek out that animal. And uh, if you're not hunting like that, you, you're, you're going to have a harder time succeeding. And, you know, I know guys that got um, private land, and, you know, they got some good bucks coming in so they think they got it made and they're just going to hunt those bucks so why would they go hunt public when they got these good, nice bucks here and you know you might look down on public but a deer doesn't know the difference between public and private what they know is pressure so there, there can be spots on that you, you know as long as there's a big buck on that public there's some place he's moving in daylight and there's some place where you can kill him just like on the, on the private it's just a matter of you might have to search more ground to find it but you got to go out and you got to find those deer. You got to hunt them down. And if you lock yourself inside that, uh, you know, I own 80 acres and I'm going to hunt here all the time. Number one, your 80 acres is going to be just like the public land because you're hunting there all the time. You know, I know a lot of public land that has less than one person per 80 acres. Right. You know, um, so, you know, it's pressure based and, uh, you just got to get outside of that box. You can't lock yourself into a small property. You know, I have a uh, property right down the street here, 70 acres. I hunted there 10 times this year, and I think I weigh over 100, honestly. 
Well, we had a lot of big bucks there this year, a lot more than usual. And I put a little more into it. And if I didn't hunt, the guy who owns the property would have been hunting there anyways. So, sure. so I put 10 hunts into that, and I think I way over hunted it. You know, so what is that? That's 10% of my whole hunting. Now, how many other people would have put their all their time into that? You know, rather than walk three miles through a swamp with a stand and sticks on your back, and you can just walk out there and climb a tree. Uh, that might be getting into lazy, or it might be getting into believing that there's, you know, it's easier there. But the less I hunt that property, the better it gets. Sure. Period. Clint, what say you? Same. When it comes to broken farm country and smaller parcels like we have, um, you know, private doesn't necessarily mean private. It means like semi-private, nearly public in some cases. Uh, You know, (laughs) we've got, you know, we've, we've got farmers that, have the kill them all attitude and we've got some that let you hunt exclusively and it's it's all about separating the wheat from the chaff you know like if i've got a property that i know that's we brother and I, my brother and i give you an example we've got a, a piece up, up here on the family farm that butts up against um some other private that we can't hunt and it gets so much pressure on the other side that we just had to physically like lay down our, our plans for that place. Be like, look, we can't do squat with this, even though we want to, we know there are bucks that are around that area. And, and we, you know, we've got a lot of Intel from the last several years of working with it. But when it comes to unseason, it's garbage because it gets so much influx from the other side. It just makes everything on our end is really difficult to contain. And we just kind of had to bail on it. It's all about, in broken farm country, it's all about trying not to spread yourself too thin. In other words, hunt 15 different spots and, and really spread yourself out, trying to coalesce that down onto the spots that are A, good habitat, and, and B, as, as as unpressured as we can have it. And, and that typically works for us. That makes complete sense. Well, we, you know, we, we, we started this whole conversation off under the premise that we were going to talk about winter scouting. And uh, I've written down a couple notes as we've, as we've talked here. And uh, Dan, you mentioned, I, I believe you phrased it, you're going to go to a spot when you see what you want. Mm-hmm. Is what you want, found at that particular time in in october november or is it a is it a cumulative amount of information that you've you've gathered over a period of time obviously i i get that you're going to be walking through the timber and you're going to see something that's blatantly obvious and you're going to use that to your advantage but if we're talking about winter scouting what is it that you're what is it that you're wanting to see at this time of year well at this time of the year um i want to see a property that's thick enough to hold deer okay year round so what's nice is you can see through a property right now all the leaves are down and stuff and you can see what you know how thick it is how um what the terrain's like um around my home is a little different than some of the other places i hunt but around my home is a very very heavily populated and very heavy pressure area I'm right between Milwaukee and Madison. I got a bunch of cities and towns all around me, Jefferson and the town of Milwaukee. There's just a million hunters around here. So this is a pretty, pretty flat farm land that's uh, mixed with swamps. And what I look for here is I'm looking for wet swamps, water, um, thick cattails, dogwood, um, the kind of stuff where you could line up 50 hunters and drive it with a gun and you're not going to kill all the big bucks. There's some going to slip through the cracks. And if hunters can line up and drive a spot and kill every deer, they will here. So in order for me to find big bucks, I have to get on properties where those big bucks can survive a gun season. And so I might look at 10 properties before I find one that has those magic ingredients. And most of the deer I find in this terrain, their bedding is isolated by water. So they're just barely into the water, but they're they're bedding in water, the bigger bucks. Um, little homes, islands, or whatever, just off of the water. So 
So when I go in in winter, uh, I follow that water edge, whether it's the edge that cattails meets the woods or dogwood meets woods or, or whatever. I follow that edge and I look for the trails coming in and out. I look for, um, um, where I can see higher ground, like a lone tree out in the, the cattails or dogwood or tamarack that's a little higher. And I'll, I'll go check and see if there's bedding around it. And I want to get close to that bedding because those big bucks aren't moving far in daylight. So I follow that transition and I can, I can speed scout a property pretty fast doing that. So at this time of the year, I'll find those bedding areas. I'll look at them really close. Um, and I will look at how the deer get in and out of them. I will, uh, pick out areas to set up. I'll try to figure out how far that deer can see, smell, and hear. When he's in a bed, I'll look at the beds and I'll determine when do I think he's bedding here based on these beds. Is he bedding here because of a crop field? Is he bedding here because of acorns? Is he bedding here because of, uh, rut? And I'm not necessarily looking for fresh beds at this time of the year. Okay. It's, it's almost better if the snow's gone because then you can see the sign from October, November. You know, you still see the beds, you know. Um, if you got a good eye and you've been doing this for a while, you can see with the snow. You can tell where they're bedding, whether there's snow or not. But I think your average person probably can't do that. But I'm making all these determinations and making a setup. And I will learn an area and learn all those bedding spots. And then in a lot of cases, I might only hunt those spots once every few years or, or whatever. Because what I'll do is um, I'll monitor the area and make sure there's a big buck in the area. When one shows up, then I'll, then I'll go in for the hunt. And I'll say, okay, now I know where the bedding is here. I know how the deer is going to be. And I'll hop from those bedding areas to bedding areas. And most of the time, if there's a big buck in there, I'll have some run-ins with them. Um, from what I learned from scouting that transition of water meets woods. Regardless of time of year. Yeah, regardless of time of year. But remember, I can look at those bedding areas and tell you probably, you know, an accurate guess at what time of year they're bedding there. You know, sometimes they're bedding there year-round, on and off. Sometimes it's for a particular reason. Sometimes it, you have to throw a hunt or two at them to figure it out. But there's usually some clues. Um, like, let's say, I find this bedding area that uh, beds barely look used. But there's giant rubs everywhere in that bed and they're all over the place. And, you, and the rubs are like, oh, look at this. Now, that would, you know, most people looking for bedding that are new to this would think they got a great area. They'd be right in their opening day. But you got you to gotta use your head a little bit and say, well, why are these beds hardly used? And there's so many rubs. Well, that's because they're bedding there during rut. Rut's when they rip up those trees. And they're only bedding there for a couple of weeks around rut. So the time to hunt that's late October. So then you'll find the spots that got, you know, you know, you know, um, good bedding, not a lot of rubs or rubs are real old and dried out. Um, but they're from this year and it's off the tip of like, a uh, an Island that's, a, that's got a acorn flat on it or something. Well, you, you can kind of assume they're there when the acorns are dropping, you know, and sometimes when you got acorns rotating where they, you know, every other year you have a good acorn year. You might have a year when those those rubs are, um, you know, the old rubs from from a year ago. That might be a better time to hunt than when the rubs are fresh, because this year you're not going to have acorns. You, you know, um, there's a lot of clues to that stuff, but it takes some time and some years under your belt to start figuring that stuff out. Hey Dan, one of your posts lately you made mention of keeping a, a, you know, a hunt journal or, or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. Do you use, do you use anything like, you know, when you're, when you're fixing to scout a place like this, how much do you rely on like topo and aerial maps? Or do you just go in there, put boots on the ground and then look at your maps? And then how do you keep track of all this? Like as much as you scout, how do you keep track of, of, all these winter spots, do you just keep it logged in your, in your mind or do you go sit down and write it out? Do you plug it into an app on the phone? How do you troubleshoot that? I usually uh, write down notes. Um, for quite a while I wasn't doing notes and, uh, what would happen is the season would go by and then I'd remember one of the spot I should have hunted and I'll go check it and it's all tore up and I'm thinking, oh, you idiot. 
you know. So I'll, I'll keep notes um, on places that I really want to go back to. Um, if you look at a couple hundred spots in a year, it's easy to forget things. You, you know, and it's easy to jumble things in your head, you know, and mix two spots together that, you know, I mean, remember one thing about one spot when you're in another spot. So those notes will really help you, you know, and especially like if you, if you, um, if you're thinking, well, I think they're bedding here because of acorns. If you don't write that down, you might forget that and you're in there at a different time of the year or something. Um, so I do notes. I know a lot of people, uh, use apps and stuff like that, but I'm kind of old school. Yeah, I'm re- frankly, I'm really surprised, Dan, that you didn't say you used an app. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, um, it, it's there's a lot of value, I think, in keeping notes um, because you do often forget, and we're all you know driven, uh, you know, especially when we get in the hunt, and it's be October, and you know you're seeing this sign, and and you just you forget about what you learned in the winter or in the early spring when you're turkey hunting or whatever the case may be. So there's there's definitely value in, in keeping a journal and and uh, reminding yourself, you know, of of maybe what you saw back then because it's likely to you know happen again. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I know you're talking winter scouting, but but if you do a year round journal. You know, I can't help but uh, think of all the times, you know, you, you make notes about when you see deer in certain places, and it seems to repeat annually. Um, you know, these bedding areas that we find um, at this time of the year, um, sometimes, you, you know, these bedding areas might peak at a certain time, and they might be really good early season, they might be really good late season, they might be really good rut, they might be really good, you know, during the supposed lull. So, um, if you keep notes, you start figuring out time frames, certain areas are, are good. And it doesn't have to be from a hunt, a kill or a sighting either. You go into these bed areas and, and you go into hunt and you notice that it's a, a ghost town. There's no rubs, there's no sign, there's no nothing. And you're like, oh, I'm getting the timing wrong here. Sure. Or you go in there and, and, and everything looks great, but the buck doesn't show up. It just means you hunted it the wrong day the signs there that they were using it so you can start getting patterns of what time of year they're using certain areas and that stuff repeats almost to the date in a lot of places so would you rely on what you get um in addition to all the the boot traffic you 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 put in um would you rely on something like trail cameras for historical data as well like I, I realize oh, that one buck may not he may, he may be dead, but it's likely that another buck is going to do something similar because of the time of year, whether it's rut related or food related or whatever the case may be. Is, is that a- accurate in your opinion? Oh, absolutely. I mean, th- this um, um, not this last season, but the season before. I was onto some really big bucks and I was on them the year before and it's a really tough spot to hunt and really remote. Um, and it's been giving me fits for years about timing and stuff like that. And this whole season I ran a cell cam in there. Um, and really learns a lot about how the deer maneuver in there and, uh, just how many big bucks that area holds. Um, you know, those cameras teach you a lot. And, and a lot of times, um, you know, guys get in that habit of over checking them and, and kind of ruining the spot. But if you can just take a camera and put it in one of those spots and let it soak, just let it sit there for the season, um, they can really teach you a lot. Clint, what, what's your thought on that? Similar. Like, I, I totally ring similar to what I found today. I, I went out um, to scout a piece that, it, just like Dan said, it has been giving me absolute fit over the last couple of years about how to hunt it and why and when and like I, I, I know a couple of big bucks that, that have survived this season in there and I wanted to go in there today and just stomp all over it and kind of reset what I what I thought I knew about it and I took the time today and I found an area that is absolutely without a shadow of a doubt 
um, what I think is one of the, the, the best buck in that on that farm's definitely his bedroom. Super thick, nasty. Got a few little. And we don't have a lot of conifers down here at all, um, but it was track. It was rubbed all the hell uh, in there, and super dense and thick. Very difficult to get to, and the, it was. It's right on the very furthest edge of all the other adjacent properties. Like, in other words, if somebody else was going to hunt it, they would have to walk through the entire property to get to this four corner area. And I'm certain there's a there's a link there with all that sign and pressure in the radius. So going back to what Dan said, soak it. Um, I'm gonna I plan on going back in there about right after spring turkey season sets in and just throwing up some soaker cams around that area and leave them until it you know it's it's the right time to hunt, which would be what it looks to me like probably late October or the first part of November before rut gets really crazy and just pull all those data points. That That's one of my absolute favorite tricks is, is letting cameras do their thing. These cameras nowadays, a lot of them will have six, eight, nine months or more battery life. What are you going to do with that data in, you know, in the middle of summer, just let them work and, and go in and check them and do it all in one foul swoop and, I think that's a definite um, plus. You got to stay off of those cameras as best you can. Yeah, you know that, that reminds me of uh, uh, something that happened to me uh, this season. There's a spot that I've been hunting for about 20 years. That's a finger that goes up into cattails, and bucks get off at the point of this. And uh, I, I haven't never really killed a lot there, but in the past we killed a couple there. Uh, and we've seen a few good ones there. Um, on good acorn years, you'll see really good rub lines coming out of here into the acorns. So I've always hunted that early season, had some action, and I'd, I'd give it a sit first week or two of the season, then I'd just abandon it because it's kind of it's kind of close to um, a lot of a lot of hunter sign and stuff. Um, and this year, um, I ran into. Uh, a hunter in the woods who recognized me, uh, a young guy. Um, he's actually um, a little turned around and needs some help getting out of the woods. So I helped him out and he recognized me and uh, started talking. And he started telling me the pictures of all the big bucks he's got on camera. And uh, uh, what was surprising is uh, we got to know each other and, and have been talking since. He told me that uh, he was hunting that point uh, and that he uh, threw a camera in there and he wished he would have hunted during rut because for 15 days straight, he had a big buck on camera in daylight every day in that point. <laughs> and I never <laughs> looked at that as a rut spot. But if I would have had a camera there, <laughs> you know, let one sulk. I would have known that, but I've been hunting that for 20 years and never hunted at rut. Why? I always looked at that as they're eating the acorns there, and that's why they're there. Dan, why didn't you look at it as, as a rut spot? What about it didn't lead you to believe that that would be a good spot to sit. Don't don't answer that right now. We're just going to take a quick break, and uh, we'll be right back and have you answer that question. So we'll give you a little time to think about it. UC Hunting Properties is a platform built for delivering knowledge gained from a lifetime spent on the land and water. An elite group of land experts spread across the nation, built to succeed, built to be the best. This new United brand is designed to raise the bar in the recreational and hunting world of real estate. UC Hunting Properties land specialists are dedicated to obtaining local knowledge in order to ensure relationships with their clients continuing beyond the transaction. For this team, it's more than selling land. It's a way of life. It's a passion, a freedom, it's uniting buyers and sellers through world-class national marketing efforts specific to recreational land and a highly functional and SEO designed website with unmatched excellence in service before, during, and after the transaction. At UC Hunting Properties, we put boots on the ground, walking acre after acre. UC Hunting Properties is moving forward. Are you?
All right. What are you, what are you thinking, Dan? Why didn't you uh, Why didn't you go to that spot? Well, like, like I said, there's a lot of hunting pressure in the area, and uh, it's easier access, um, and the whole area gets a lot of rut pressure. Now, I know that that exact spot don't get a lot of pressure, but uh, it just it screamed early season to me. You know, um, for me, the uh, finding bucks in the rut in that particular marsh with the pressure it has um, would always be deeper. You know, but uh, cameras don't lie. And sometimes just throwing a camera in one of those spots and, and checking it, you, you learn a lot. Yeah, I I, I had, uh, I, I don't even know anymore how many trail cameras I had out this year. But uh, one of the things that I did do is, is Clint and I talked about it a lot last summer, and that's just to let them soak. And, and that's what I did. And, and uh, I, I was filming um, for the better part of the first, let's call it half of the, the rut, um, the end of October through, you know, November 6th or 7th. So I didn't check any of those cameras really during that time and didn't get around to it till later. And, and I was, I was surprised at how many bucks showed up repeatedly day after day, after day, after day, after day, um, you know, dependent upon a little bit on, upon, you know, wind, wind direction and, and condition, but, uh, it just, leads me to believe that they're going to probably do the same thing next year. And th- that's probably why I stuck the stand there because I saw all the sign in the first place. So um, I, there's definitely a ton of value, I think, in, in letting those cameras just sit and not putting pressure on them. Yeah. Clint, do you, yeah, on that, do, do you, do you, on, on that point real quick, yeah, um, but, like one of the things that, that I, I don't know, I like to do with my quote soaker cameras is, it sounds backwards, but I feel like if I check them right around the Halloween to the, you know, 7th of November, that really hot time. And and they say they've been in the woods for six months. Now is the actionable time that I can use that day to, to crowd one and kill him if he's there. So, and I think, I, I don't know, this may be me personally, but I feel like I can get away with running in, and checking those soaker cameras um, when they're letting their guard down a little bit. And that's how I killed that buck of mine this year was I, after a busted hunt, I went and checked um, four or five cameras that had been in there since um, the early part of June. And that buck that I shot was all over those cameras multiple times a day for two or three days uh, before I went in and made the play and killed him. And and so I think, timing of your checks on those soap cameras is important if you're going to try and use them as a strategy to hunt around and, and what better time to try and squeeze tight in on one is when they're letting their guard down chasing a bit. Yeah, you know, I would agree with that and disagree. There's, um, I've killed quite a few deer on you check a camera and you see a daylight picture. You're like, well, hell I'll try this tomorrow. And, and, and went into the next day and killed the thing. But, um, most of those were in feeding areas or open areas. And I actually think that the point I was talking about, I probably could have did what you're just saying. But um, that camera I was talking about earlier, that uh, that cell cam, I was getting all those pictures of them bucks day after day. Um, there was 16 different um, open young bucks come past that camera. One of them was Peter and Blue Crockett. Um, those bucks started coming in on a regular basis in rut just coming through day after day after day in daylight. I went in there hunted it one day and it went dead for mm, probably two weeks before they started creeping back. And you see the nervousness when you come back. It's because I'm going into the core area. So it all depends on exactly where that camera is, how much, how often you can get away with checking it. In some, in some situations, I think you're better off with a cell cam if you can if you use it for hunting. Um, but in some applications, you can go walk out and check the camera almost daily, and, and it won't bother the deer. Like, uh, case in point, the uh, conservancy I hunt, we're starting to learn that I can I can hunt and overhunt and put cameras all over the place and check them daily on the walking trail where everybody walks. You know, whether it's a photographer, a hiker, or a hunter, the 
access trail that they walk, that access trail goes through the whole property right past the bedding areas and stuff, and the deer have to walk across it. They get used to that human scent, and they put up with it. And I can put a camera on that trail, and deer won't even bend over to smell my scent on the ground. They just pay no attention to it, you know? Um, it all has to do with placement, and it has to do with the deer, too. You'll see one or two deer have an attitude where they don't really care, especially during rut, like, sure. like, like Quint uh, was saying. But, um, but it can have an impact. And I think a lot of it has to do with, with where we're talking. And like with me, with hunting really close to those bedding areas, they tolerate a lot less when you're, when you're, you know, within a certain range of that bedding area, you know? So let me, let me ask you this, since we started this whole thing off, um, under the premise that we were going to talk about winter scouting, um, <laughs> when, when you, you know me, I go off on tangents all the time. That's all right. right. <laughs> that's, that's all right. Um, it's it's still uh it's still good stuff. Um, I'm just curious when you find stuff in the winter, like for instance, you know, let let's say you're gonna go for a walk tomorrow, uh, and you're gonna you're gonna scout a property, and and you find um you know a bunch of beds where you know you would expect that they probably are. Um, it, does that mean that? That excuse me. That doesn't mean that they're always going to be there. How do you take that information that you find now and turn it into something usable down the road, say in October or November or December? Well, well again, um, I go look at a bed and area now. That's just one piece of the picture. Okay. So generally, if, if it's an area I want to hunt, I want to learn um, all the area, all the spots where I think a mature buck will be bedding. Um, like let's say we're in my area near my home where it's all swamps. I walk that transition of water meets woods and I look at all the bedding along that and I can go through a pretty large property and scout it pretty quick. You know, it means I'm also going to look at the islands, but I'm going to look at the, that whole edge, right? Mm -hmm. So I might walk through 20 different bedding areas and I'll take notes to each one of those bedding areas and where I was sitting in that. And I'm pretty confident if a big buck's in there, I walk through the dead area he's going to be in. You know, if he's in there, he's in one of those. Pretty confident of that. Now, the sign might might trick some people and they might say, well, I don't know, I don't know. A pretty good chance he's in one of those bed areas. You know, usually if I hunt those bed areas down, I run into them. Um, you look, look at the, uh, the marsh behind my house that I hunt a lot. Mm -hmm. There is, I know of hundreds of bed areas in there. You know, from from one or two beds to, you know, 30, 40 in a quarter acre. But I, I know all the little bed in there is in there. However, when I think back to all the mature bucks I've shot back during the past 30 years, um, the ones that are actually mature bucks, you know, four or older, seem to come from the same bed in there. So like every time you see a mature buck, or they come from the same spot. It's like the, the best spot to hold those bucks. Um, and they're not always the ones you think they're going to be. But you, once you learn those, they just keep coming from them. But the, the, the point that, you know, I went kind of on a tangent, but the point is that when you walk through those bed areas, he's coming from one of them, you know, or, or several of them. But you, you have to hunt those bedding areas down. And it really ain't that difficult. You know, don't be looking at the ones that are, you know, a lot of beds, but they're up in a grass field. You know, if it's a pressured area, but, you know, don't be looking at the ones that are, you know, in a couple pine trees up on the, on the hill in, in the snow because they're probably bedding there during the winter. You know, um, mm -hmm. stick to the ones that are in the terrain right where they should be, you know, in that isolated water area, you know, in, in the swamps or, you know, in the hills and, and farms and stuff. It gets a little different, but you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. They're, 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 they just Dan, seem... is this the time? Go ahead, Clint. Dan, it, it, is, uh, is this the time of year when you're, w when you're, you know, in the winter scouting, uh, theme here, when you're gathering up that bedroom intel on them, do you do anything as far as plan your routes in and out at this time? 
or, or do you just kind of wing that as you go forward next season? What I, what I do is, uh, is I go from the bedding area back. So once I find where they're bedding, I determine why, when, how, where. I want to ask myself all kinds of questions about why is this deer here? When is he here? What's he doing here? What's his escape route? How is he coming out of here? So then I look at the trails coming out of the bedding. And I want to get as close as I can without being seen, heard, or, or smelled. And then I'm thinking about, okay, now how am I getting here? About this deer knowing, knowing I'm there. So I plan everything right when I'm there. And the thing I, I want to do is I want to go in there once or twice, figure it out, figure out what trees I'd be in on what winds or whatever, um, see if there's anything I have to change. If I have to cut a limb or something, I'd rather do it when I'm in there looking at it than try to do that while there's a deer 75, 80 yards away from me, right? So I go in there, figure everything out, and I go from the bed back. And then when I come back to hunt, I have a plan, and, and I have that plan. I I already know how I need to access that, and it could change based on wind or or uh, some other factor. And uh, a lot of times, I don't actually pick out a tree. I pick out an area, and then I go to, into that area, and based on the factors of that day, I might set up a little different. Um, and sometimes you get in there, and the sign changes a little. It shifts a little over, like the rub line coming out of the bed area might be, a, you know, 20, 30 yards over from where it was the year before. Um, and it might be because when he's coming out over there, he's going to acorns. Now he's coming out and he's going to, to some plants. You don't even know what it is. You know, um, they are browsers. They eat a lot of stuff. Um, so you might have to shift when you get there. So there's kind of a loose plan on exactly where I'm going to sit. But I know where he's going to be and where he's going to be coming from, and I know how I got to get there based on the wind. Right. But uh, I figure I'll let up when I go in there. What what criteria makes one of those spots for you, Dan? Is there a, is there a certain amount of of clues that you need before it completely gets your attention? But uh, or is there a checklist? And if there was a checklist, what would Dan Infault's checklist be for a place? like you just described? Well, the, the hard ones are, is when, you know, there's like a, a five or 10 beds and there's not really much for rubs or there's small rubs coming in and out. Then it makes you wonder. I mean, if you have a spot that has a few big rubs, then, that, then it's got my attention. But, uh, ideally the, the better spots where I've killed big bucks year after year, have a lot of beds and usually have rubs around them coming in and out, um, but not always. Um, I think about uh, two bedding spots in the same marsh not far from each other. Um, one of them I've killed uh, probably about uh, seven or eight bucks out of with the bow, with archery. Mm-hmm. And I've put multiple friends in there who've killed big bucks out of there. And, and uh, some of the bucks are fairly large. Um, in the other spot, I've killed some pretty nice bucks out of two with gun. During gun season, they're always better than this one area. Um, but they're their bow, too. It's just it's kind of treeless and hard to hunt with a bow. Um, but the one the one where I'm gun hunting, even though they're there, and they're there right through the rut, there's really hardly ever any rubs. Usually there's one or two big rubs. But the other one where I've been bow killing them, it's just ripped up. So, but the, 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 the factor that's the same is both of those spots, there's about an acre size area they're bedding in, and there's about, you know, maybe a hundred beds in, in, in that acre. Where they shift around based on the winds and stuff. A hundred beds in that acre? Probably. Yeah, Crazy. Both of them. Yeah. That is... And do you, do you think that and, those... And maybe I'm off a little bit, of, but it's, it's a lot. Right. You, you know, it's like every bush, they got a way of bedding around it sure. and they're worn in bed, you know. I, and I can assume that that changes based on terrain, because if you're going to go to farm country um, or hill country, that it's going to be different because they don't have probably such a um, specific spot that they have to bed because there's water surrounding well, it. Or, or am I wrong? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe not. You, you know, um, 
thinking about uh, hill country, like uh, you get into rolling hills um, that we have here, but we have more of them down uh, maybe Clint's Way and uh, further south. Um, and then up here, if you get more into the western Wisconsin, you get those really sharp hills. Mm-hmm. Well, you get into sharp hills, um, you know, where there's uh, a military crest and, and a pretty rapid drop off. Those bucks in that hill country have to have a specific spot where they put that bed, right where the military crest is. Mm-hmm. But if they get into rolling hills, kind of in, in the southern areas, um, those beds vary quite a bit, and they move them quite a bit based on the, the wind and the uh, thermals and stuff. Sure. So seeing the beds down there is really tough, and and then you might have a, a hillside that has, you know, twenty, thirty beds on one hill. And they're really hard to see because of the leaves and stuff, unless they've been compressed in the last day or two. Um, but you get up into the hills where sh- that sharp drop off and those beds are worn into the ground. And a guy would think that the, the hill in the bluff country where it's got the military crest is a way better spot because you can see those beds, you can see the shape of the deer, they're worn into the mud. And it's just that they live, they bed in that exact spot all the time. But they might bed on that hill down by, like, by Clint. More than they bed on the hill with the warning bed, but they're moving so much that you can't find a bed. So it's kind of a catch twenty two. You, you got to you got to figure out what they're doing in your area, but it's so terrain based that once you figure the bedding out, it's in the same spots. You, you know, everywhere you look, um, and it's real easy to 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 map out in all terrains. Is it fair to say then that it's for you, it's all about the bedding. It is because um, you know if you want to kill actual mature bucks, I do. Um, getting close enough to kill them in daylight is tough. And and if you think about uh, the bucks I've shot from bedding, the majority of them I've shot in the last ten minutes of legal light, and I'm I'm hunting seventy five to two hundred yards from their bed. You know, a lot of cases I've watched the buck get out of the bed and come to me, and it's almost closing time by the time they get to where I can shoot them. Uh, what are you going to do if you're, you know, 200 yards back? You're not going to see them. Yeah, you just, you're not going to see them. And that's going to diminish your confidence, and then a whole bunch of other bad things happen. Clint, your thoughts? Right, and that's not to say those bucks don't get that far. They right. just don't do that every day. Right, you know, you know I, I mean, where I hunt, they get to every day. If they're better, they're, they're going to make it to you. Right, I got you. Yeah, I, Dan, how much, uh, like with, you know, this time of year, social media is blown sky high with guys out shed hunting. Um, how much time during the during the winter month, off season, whatever you want to call it, do you devote to just walking about and shed hunting? Uh, versus the opposite and, and doing exactly what we've been talking about all night, which is winter scouting. You, you know, there, there's been a time or two in the last 10 or 20 years that I've tried shit hunting, but I always end up scouting. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> I knew you could say that. <laughs> Dan, would you like to go I shed hunting? <laughs> <laughs> I'll end up picking out trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh gosh um you know you you just we were just talking about shed hunting and and i went with uh a buddy of mine on saturday and we specifically were going in to look for this buck that we had filmed um this summer and uh had gotten uh he had gotten several trail camera pictures um and you talk about the why the when the how and then the where um, and what was really, um, obvious to me is because we found the buck, unfortunately we found him dead. He was, a, uh, I would say he was a gross boon. Um, you guys probably saw the picture on social media, but when, when you saw where he was living, you could see, um, exactly why he was living, where he was living. It just made so much sense. And, you know, absent that buck, I think, you know, if that buck wasn't there, I don't know that I would have picked up on 
the area that I was in when I was in that area, but it was a good lesson for me. Um, you know, he was up above, he could look down on everything. He could bet on either, um, basically every side of this knob, um, to put the wind in his favor. He was actually betted not far, um, from, you know, a residence, not, not far at all, but he, he could keep tabs literally on everything. Everything that was going on in his world, he w he was able to keep tabs on from somewhere within that two or three acres, uh, and and that's um, if there's one thing that I've learned, especially this last year, is, is that's what those big deer will do. Um, you know, yeah, and that's pretty common. I mean, when you find a bed of a of a buck that's um, four years old or older that he uses on a regular basis, um, once you realize what he's got going on there, there usually is pretty much a, a wow factor, like wow. Right. He's got it made. How do you get close to him? You know, wow, this thing really knows what's going on from this position. Yep. And and you start to realize that there's nothing random about how those things bet. And that's what makes me have an edge on finding betting is because I know what kind of factors you're looking for in each train. Um, because it's, it's repeatable. But they've got that wall factor where they are set up in the best possible position to monitor everything that's going on in that area. Yeah, I'm totally agree there. I, Dan, I watched your, uh, when your farm, I live in broken farm country. And when I watched your farm country bedding DVD and started applying a lot of that to what I already knew, like it, it, it that DVD reinforced things that I already knew, but really drove it home for me. Like the things that I've been seeing, isn't random. A lot of these farm country bucks that we have here are edge betters and they spy on us as much as we like to try and spy on them. Uh, right. and, and that, that, yeah. And so you get those beds where the more you investigate one of these edge beds and realize that he's got so much in his advantage, then you start picking them out at all different times of the year, in, including winter, like, this may not be a bed now in the winter months, but I'll guarantee you it's one during the early part of the season when he's got more cover. Um, you know, these edge beds like that, that, that DVD really drove that home for me. And, and the more I physically go and l literally will sit down in suspected beds and look around and just take it all in, uh, the, the more you realize they're spying on us more than more than you think right that they're, they're uh, you know we talk about doing observation sits that's what those bucks are doing <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> i scout a lot of people's uh properties for them um and one thing i find a lot is probably in about 50 percent of the properties i look at you find where some big buck is watching the access and the, and the hunters seem to always use the same axis and all and the, the time buck Bedded there watching that axis, and it's very, very common. Way more common than what people realize. Super, super common where I'm at. Is it as easy as finding a spot, Dan and Clint, um, and you're in that spot, and if you can observe everything um, in you? In, in your general vicinity, in other words, if you have a vantage point, whether it's a, a knob in a marsh where you can ob observe a lot and likely smell a lot, um, that and there's there's very few of those places on any given property, but but I can guarantee that there's probably one just about everywhere. Is it safe to assume that that's probably going to be a big betting a big buck betting spot? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe. I mean, it's still going to have the factors the buck needs. But, uh, you, you, you know, for me, what if it has I a don't think I look it? at a property like, <laughs> um, like most hunters do. I look at it in an aspect of, uh, if I was that deer, where would I be? Right. You know, almost give, give that deer the credit, like almost like you could think like you or me, mm -hmm. where would I be if I had to be here and somebody was trying to kill me? Where would I be? Where, how would I protect myself? I'd get my back up on that ridge and I'd watch over here. And if I could smell like a deer, I could smell back there. I could watch over here. And you start putting that together and you think, well, nobody ever goes over there. And, and all of a sudden you start realizing you walk to those spots and there's that big buck bed. 
you know, those things set them up and themselves up in positions to monitor you, um, smell from behind, see in front of front of them, and watch. You know, they always have good back cover to escape, or you know, at least some good escape way. If you if, you know when you come at them, you know, um, especially in that farm country like uh, like Clint hunts. I mean, they love to get on the the downward edge of woodlots and watch. The, like the opening from a lot of times they'll get right on the food source where hunters are hunting and these guys will have cameras out there and they get pictures of these bucks day after day and they're like but when I go in there and hunt them they're not there well they're watching you climb the tree you know and in a lot of cases in those properties we do observations you know or whatever during the season to kind of try and figure them out if we don't know the bedding hmm. Clint Anything you want to add? Yeah. Um, not really, man. I, I think you've covered it. I, one of the, I will tell Dan this, like one of the things that I have taken great, like it makes me feel like I'm getting it more and more every year is when I can like blindly just see a spot from, you know, a hundred yards away and walk over to it especially in like the winter time, like now, like I kind of did today, walk over to it and I find one of those wallered out spots in the ground and I find a few little deer hairs in it. Like that makes me feel like I know what I'm doing. It, it, it you know, I got to give Dan the credit on, on that because it, a lot of his approach has taught me how to do that. But there's no, you know, again, there's no substitute for putting your own boots out there and doing that. But one of my favorite activities during this time of year really isn't shed hunting for me. I mean, I, I don't, I don't really care to pick up 70 or 80 sheds a year. I love it. I do like it, but I like to go out there and pick up little tufts of deer hair and go, yeah, I know where I'm at now. Like that makes me feel really good. Right. You're putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Mm hmm. And I think that's, that's something that that's often, uh, often miss wouldn't you agree dan no absolutely absolutely um I, you, you know a lot of times uh a guys are going to struggle their first year or two um maybe even three um trying to think like this and try to hunt like this and trying to scout like this but at some point if you've looked at enough of this bedding and you keep doing it it starts to click with a guy mm-hmm. and at that point you start walking into the wood lots and stuff and looking around and like clint said you look at it and you're like, nah, there's going to be one bedding right there. You walk over there and the beds are there. And then you start, you start realizing where the deer are going to come from and it starts getting better and better and better. And then at some advanced part, you start to be able to predict when the bucks are going to be using these bedding areas and your hunting starts getting substantially uh, better year after year. And it, you know, we, and this, we're talking about uh, winter scouting, but really scouting is kind of a year round thing. And just finding those beds ain't, ain't the, the big clue. The big clue is, you know, knowing where all those bedding areas are and then looking around and finding when the sign picked up in an area saying, okay, he's in here someplace. And where are all those beds I looked at? Instead of just randomly hopping from bed and area to bed and area to bed and area over and over and over again, hoping to hit it when he's there, you know, actually hunting for a reason and mixing that with knowing where the bedding is. And you really start to get uh, the action. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, we've taken well over an hour of your time, which is easy to do when we get you on the line, Dan. Um, any final thoughts? No, just thinking about the next one. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Always, right? Exactly. Exactly. I I know that, uh, you know, coming from farm country and relatively small woodlots, it's been a frustrating experience, you know, trying to learn uh, how to hunt hill country and bigger timber and stuff like that. But uh, it, it does take a while. You got to deploy some patience and um, I feel good about next year. But I said that last year. So um, this year I'm going to try not to film quite as much. Clint, any uh, any any final thoughts from you? Same, man. Uh, just on to the next one, and uh, 
try and shore up some of the places in the off season that I felt like I was maybe weak in this year, or you know, like Dan said, just always constantly evolve and and just try to get better every single year until I can't go no more. Right on. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks again, Dan, for taking time out of your evening. We certainly appreciate that. Anything that you want us to know about the hunting beast or about any upcoming scouting workshops? Uh, I've got some coming up, but I don't have the dates planned yet. We're planning on doing a, a big woods one for sure. And we're thinking about doing a farm slash hill one too, but I have to scout some property. Uh, and make sure it'll work. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll, uh, we'll watch for those dates on the, um, on the, either the hunting beast, uh, not the forum, but, uh, on, on Facebook, you can I'm sure I'm find it on the forum as well, but you'll have that, uh, mm-hmm. well advertised. Now, how quick are yeah, spots? Uh, up? uh, uh, the, the, the March one, uh, actually we didn't fill all the spots. So, but I think if we do one in the big woods, we haven't done one of those. Um, I think it'll fill up pretty quick. Yeah, probably. So, um, right, when, what are you saying? Probably the hill farm one too. Big ones, you're, you're big woods rather. You're talking up north. Yeah, we, we want to do one over by, uh, Clark County, uh, sure. Wisconsin. Um, I'd like to do the area where I hunted for that, uh, bear bait buck that was a uh, oh. uh, 200 inch non-typical that uh, uh, showed up on one of my bear baits over there and uh, I hunted him for a season. I think it would be cool to do it there. That's that's uh, that's a neat country up there. I just sold a farm up there. Um, it's, it's not closed yet, but uh, just riding through it and walking through it was uh, I was surprised at the amount of deer sign up there. Mm-hmm. Definitely big woods country. Um, yeah, if any of your uh, viewers want to, you know, they're curious um, and they want to learn more, uh, my uh, YouTube page is obviously free and has some really good content in it that uh, shows some of the hunts in the bedding areas and stuff. Okay, definitely. And you, and you said you think you're going to have a farm country slash hill country workshop as well? If you can put it We're going to try. I'm... I'm um, I, I got to go look at a property. I've, I've hunted there before, but I haven't hunted there in a while. And I know some things have changed. And I just want to make sure that it lays out well. Okay. So people get their money's worth. And if it looks like it'll lay out well, I'll do it. Are you sold out of the B sticks already? The pre-orders? Uh, I haven't checked. Mario runs up, but I do think we do have pre-orders. I think we have pre-orders up. They're about three months out, but uh, yeah, I think we are like. selling B sticks. Yeah. Okay. Any any uh, news on the stand front yet? Yeah, tomorrow uh, tomorrow morning I'm going to production to look at uh, some platforms uh, we had machined up and do some more testing. Um, I made a uh, I, I made some final versions of the seats, but I think I'm, I'm going to take a little more weight out of them because they're they don't weigh anything now. They want to float away, but uh, basically parked a truck on them and they don't give it all. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're getting we're getting really far with that, and it ain't, ain't going to be long. We're going to be uh, taking pre-orders on that. Any idea when you you want to care to guess? Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to give a date. Um, but I think uh, by summer we should uh, we should have stands for sale. Awesome. We'll look forward to looking for that, and and uh, definitely uh, share anything that you guys put out on social media on our social media stuff. Appreciate um, it. All right. Well, with that, we'll close out the show for tonight. Um, again, appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, have a good rest of your night. All right. Thanks, guys. You bet. Take care. Yeah, thanks, guys. Good talking to you. I'll see you. Well, there you have it. Another episode of the White Knuckle Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show and hope you picked up a few nuggets of information along the way that you can use down the road. Uh, I want to take just a second and thank our partner in this endeavor, and that is UC Hunting Properties. Without them, this couldn't be possible. Um, You guys all know that I work with UC Hunting Properties, and they're actually nationwide. Um, I would encourage you, for any of your property needs, go to www.uchuntingproperties.com. Thanks for listening. Jason out. (laughs) 